It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Emmanuel Obiechina for the third and final installment of the Macmillan Stewart Lectures. Uh, the series is entitled Africa in the Soul, What We Can Learn from the 18th and 19th Century African Slave Narratives. Uh, Emmanuel N. Obiechina is a distinguished scholar and literary critic sought after for his keen and thoughtful interpretations of African literature and the African diaspora. Obiechina received his bachelor's in English from University College in Ibadan, uh, Nigeria, an affiliate of the University of London in 1961, and his PhD in English from the University of Cambridge in 1967. With 20 years of teaching experience, Obiechina has taught students at universities in both the US and Africa, from 2000 to 2003, Obiechina was a visiting scholar in the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University, where he was also a fellow of the Du Bois Institute. In 2000, he was the Langston Hughes Professor of English in African and African American Studies at the University of Kansas, where he also delivered the Langston Hughes Lecture. Obiechina was also the first professor appointed to the endowed post of the Forrest S. and Jean B. Williams NEH Professor of the Humanities at Ferrum College in Ferrum, Virginia. Obiechina also has held several senior level management positions, including that of Director of the Nigerian University's Office at the Nigerian Embassy in Washington, D.C., where he represented Nigeria's universities in the Americas and the Caribbean. His role there also included coordinating educational exchanges and faculty research interests and interfacing with the World Bank and many world-class research institutions. Between 1974 and 1986, he held the post of acting president, deputy vice chancellor, dean of the graduate school, and chair of the English department at the University of Nigeria in Insuka, Nigeria. His honors include being awarded a first shrift entitled Meditations on African Literature, edited by Dube Mokafo, and awards for humanistic perspectives on contemporary society from the Ford Foundation. Additional prizes include several NEH Summer Institute appointments, as well as fellowships at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars, the University of Cambridge, and a Fulbright Travel Fellowship for Senior African Scholars. Obiechina has also written numerous publications, including Mask Song for Our Times, 2003, Language and Theme, Essays on African, Language, on African Literature, 1990, Africa Shall Survive, 1982, Culture, Tradition, and Society in West African Novel, 1975, and several others. Uh, his third installment, in the Macmillan Stewart Lectures is entitled African Narratives and the Age of Enlightenment in Defense of the True Integrity of the Race. Please join me in welcoming Professor Emmanuel Obiechina. I'll devote this last talk to looking at the works of Olaude Kwano, Phyllis Wheatley, and Ignatius Sancho, who were closest to the Western world and the Western tradition, and consequently to the European Enlightenment ideas. In their works, they responded directly and indirectly to those ideas, especially those ideas reflected on, Afri reflected on Africa and, uh, and the Africans. They were equally aware of the racism of their day, and they responded to it by defending Africa and Africans against the more deleterious of those ideas. I'll begin with Olauda Ekwano. Equano's perception of himself in his creative role 
is explicit in the title of his narrative. The interesting narrative of the life of Olaude Okwano or Gustavus Vasa the African, written by himself. He was not simply an African telling his own personal story, like, say, James Albert Okoso Gronioso or Venture Smith, his contemporaries, but he was the African, a representative and definitive figure with the soulful conception of himself as a special spokesman of his people and articulator of their aspirations. As Peter Fryer informs us, quote, Equano had won widespread recognition as principal spokesman of Britain's black community. In his dedicatory letter to the first volume of his narrative, which was addressed to the members of the British Parliament, Equano states his intention for writing the book as follows. Permit me with the greatest deference and respect to lay at your feet the following genuine narrative, the chief design of which is to excite in your august assemblies a sense of compassion for the miseries which the slave trade has entailed on my unfortunate countrymen. May the God of heaven inspire your hearts with peculiar benevolence on that important day when the question of abolition is to be discussed. The narrative is thus an extended appeal directed at the conscience of those in whose power it was to put an end to a great evil. Equano was drawing upon the affective possibilities of storytelling to resolve an issue of moral, economic, social, cultural, and psychological crisis in his day, to remake the world by helping to right a terrible wrong. By doing so, he appropriated for himself a role that is both public and historical. In seeking to influence the abolition of the slave trade, he became a voice of moral authority and a spokesman for the durable values of civilization, including the values of compassion, humanity, justice, and freedom. He assumed a role which modern African writers would, long after him, take up and make their own in our times, the role of defenders of the people and their hallowed interests, and custodians of the moral conscience of society. Even though the overt purpose of Equanos' narrative is the abolition of slavery and the liberation of its African victims, yet in the depth and complexity of its inner structure, it goes far beyond that intention. It accommodates such themes as the restoration of the human integrity of the African restoration of the image of the African environment as a human habitation and of African culture as a human system worthy of respect. In the narrative, a central character stands out in clear relief against a background of clearly drawn environment and society. The consciously selected ethnographic details are meant to give the reader a coherent view of a way of life that is self-sustaining, dignified, and full of vitality. But more importantly, Equano uses the opportunity to answer some of the stereotypical views held by Europeans about Africans, about Africans. He is presenting factual information while at the same time educating his readers about a way of life that had been grossly misconstrued 
are misrepresented. He rationalizes, illustrates, compares, and contrasts, and generally attempts to make what is unfamiliar familiar to the non-African reader. Thus, for example, he answers the imputation of barbarism by describing the political and judicial institutions of his Iseke homeland that ensured stability, the intellectual class and its particular uh, rules, the aesthetics and recreational activities, health and beauty matters, dietary habits, architecture and the disposal of space, economic and commercial activities. All of these are described with the insider's certitude and in a manner to indicate their functional adequacy. Simplicity and practicality are cardinal attributes. For example, houses are simple and functional and affordable in Iseke. Local materials are used and, quote, every man is a sufficient architect for the purpose, end of quote, with the support of the community, of course. Obviously, under these circumstances, everyone had a home. There were no homeless people. On the stereotypical view that Africans are congenitally lazy, Iguano affirms that the opposite is indeed the case. Everyone participates in agricultural labor, including the children, he writes. As we are unacquainted with idleness, we have no beggars. As for physical beauty, Iguano wrote back at those who said that black people were ugly, with the view that the matter is highly subjective. So also is the matter of skin color. He clinches his argument with reference to albinos, whose white skin was regarded by Africans as a form of deformity. As to the view that his people were foul eaters, he countered with the view that they were healthy eaters. They ate bullocks, goats, chickens, and an assortment of vegetables simply and tastefully prepared. He added a gentle dig at the Europeans with their over-refined cuisine. Quote, those refinements in cookery which debauch the, the taste. Beyond the portrayal of his land of birth and revisiting what Senghor calls the kingdom of childhood, Ikwana developed a unique strategy for dealing with the world of white people, a world he saw both exoculturally and endoculturally. He had lived within it from the age of 12 until his death at the age of 52, but he preserved his privilege as an African and therefore as a man with outsider's perspective on white life. He was able to criticize it from the outside, but he also had another perspective as an honorary member of the British society, in which position he married a British girl and tried to integrate himself into the, his adopted home. Equanor's major strategy in the narrative was to present an image of Africa on terms in which it could be contrasted with Europe. He took full advantage of his peculiar situation to compare and contrast with logical consistency the strengths and weaknesses of the two ways of life. He presented the first extended critique of Europe by an African and also defined a method of doing so which was to be used to answer European cultural arrogance in the age of imperialism. The writer was looking at a lifestyle which was flawed and which would be readily disparaged. The approach was of the nature of a dialectic or the answering of an argument with a counter-argument in the nature of a refutation. 
In the 18th and 19th, in the 17th and 18th centuries, a number of European philosophers had propounded theories of civilization and progress which were predicated on the primacy of reason over feeling, emotion, and intuition, with the implication that those whose world outlook was determined by reason had a legitimacy in promoting progress and, and universal civilization, and were thus mandated to control and dominate those whose world outlook and methods of action were controlled primarily by feelings, passions, and raw sensations. Such theories of civilization and progress naturally accepted those sociocultural and technological markers of Western achievement as the yardsticks for determining a universal civilization. Such, Eurocent uh, such Eurocentrically biased ideas were used to le legitimize the domination of Africans who were placed low on the rationalist ladder. Nor did the contrast end with the intellectual and sociocultural achievements of Europeans and Africans. It extended to morality. Europeans were implicitly, implicitly and explicitly regarded as morally superior to Africans. Their moral elegance sharply contrasted with the moral degeneracy of Africans. These racist pseudo-rationalist ideas were used to legitimize enslavement of Africans in the 16th, 17th, and early 18th centuries, and later in the 19th and early 20th centuries to defend imperialism in Africa. African writers from Equiano to Equency, this phrase actually is not mine, it's uh, Chino Achebe's. African writing is defined as writing by black people from Equiano to Equency. Uh, these people have used their works to refute these theories and their overlay of racism. It is to the credit of Equiano that his narrative first def defined a strategy for assailing these theories and ideas. He removed the argument from the plane of abstract speculation to the realm of experience. The experience of real men and women and children whose lives and actions are analyzed and assessed on standards of conventional humanity and even by standards of reasonableness deducible from the European philosophers. When Europeans are judged by the claims made for them by their philosophers that they espouse reason and abjure passion, the reverse is often found to be the case. The documented evidence of brutalities, that's what Equano is really doing in his narrative, is very intricately document cases of brutalities and rampant violence and even some horrible atrocities committed against African slaves, including the Zong massacre in which 132 Africans were drowned by the captain of a slave ship to enable ship owners collect insurance money. These are used by Equano to challenge the European claim of moral superiority over Africans. In the narrative, the contrast is often explicitly stated as, for example, the gentle treatment given to domestic slaves in Africa, which is contrasted with the severity with which slaves were treated in the plantations of the West Indies and the Americas. He writes in his narrative, quote, I must acknowledge in honor of those sable destroyers of human human rights, that I never met with any ill treatment or saw any offered to their slaves except tying them when necessary to keep them from running away. Equano does not justify slavery, whether by Africans or by Europeans, 
Even though, before he became a victim himself, he had not seen slavery as a moral evil, but he is drawing a real distinction between those he called those sable destroyers of human rights and the Europeans whose superior technology made them more efficient in oppressing their victims. Notice, for example, the barbaric treatment of the black woman in a Virginian plantation whose ordeal horrified young Equiano newly brought into slavery. Quote, the poor creature was cruelly loaded with various kinds of iron machines. She had one particularly on her head, which locked her mouth so fast that she could scarcely speak and could not eat nor drink. The contrivance was called the iron muzzle. Equano did not dispute the technological superiority of Europeans, but the question he raised and which many African writers after him have been raising since is this. What use is technology if instead of its being utilized to increase human happiness is negatively employed to cause pain and destroy human security? The importance of the narrative lies in part on its positive affirmation of Africa and its world, and on the integration of the interests of the narrator with those of his fellow Africans, those he calls his sable brethren, whose cause he took up and made his own. Most importantly, he was fully alert to the intellectual climate of his day and distilled from it important insights technical knowledge, and viable attitudes with which he enriched his own life and most relevantly prepared himself to construct and defend his narrative. He read widely and quoted extensively from the Bible, works of literature, travelogues, moral and edificatory work, works, and even controversial essays. Equano was aware of the risk of writing an autobiography in which he expressed strong independent views that were in many particulars quite controversial for his times. It was sure to excite the active hostility of promoters of racial slavery and upholders of the ideology of human inequality. They would be outraged that a mere slave could muster enough self-confidence to write a book that had become an instant success and a bestseller. He therefore took the precaution of being fastidiously factual, of acknowledging all indebtedness in footnotes, and of including authentic authenticating de details that would disarm would-be critics and help him to defend the integrity of his story. It is as if he knew that among his critics would be not only his contemporaries, whom he quickly dispatched, he was very good at controversies, but also academic skeptics who would, in the late 20th century, raise the question of his identity. Fortunately, Equano had done his work so well that it is pretty easy to defend it on its own intrinsic merit. On the question of Equano's identity, for instance, whether he was a West Indian African born in the Danish island of Santa Cruz, as suggested by some of his contemporaries, or whether he was an African American born in the state of South Carolina and assuming an African persona in order to advance his personal ambitions as one of his academic editors has said in recent publications. It's obvious that looking at the internal evidence based on the Igbo words and names which occur in the narrative, together with their dialectal inflection, coupled with the ethnographic data which Equano had painstakingly embedded 
within his story, we have determined without great difficulty his place of birth, which is on the existing map of southeastern Nigeria, and his way of life, which is still verifiable to this day. He could only have been born in Iseke and nowhere else. Ignatius Sancho and Phyllis Whitley were more deeply educated in the Western tradition, both reflected greater affinity in style and language to the Western literary models of the 18th century. Sancho was taken to England at the age of two and Phyllis Whitley to America at eight. Both, therefore, had earlier exposure to the Western culture than the others. Coincidentally, both were in the services of liberal families which gave them every encouragement to enter into the official culture of their new countries and to participate in each country's literary activities. Notwithstanding these factors, which seem to place them in the literary mainstream of Augustan England and New Classical America. Both writers were intensely aware of their African identity and used their works to promote this identity and to deal with issues that affected Africa and the Africans seriously. African presence in Phyllis Whitley's poetry is most obviously expressed through overt statements of identification. In poem after poem, she painstakingly informs the reader of her identity. She is an African muse. There is no equivocation about that and no apologies. She states it with a matter of fact finality that seems to answer those who saw or imply that the fine art of verse making should remain an exclusive field of adventure and conquest for the Caucasians. In her poem addressed to the University of Cambridge in New England, in which she admonished the young scholars to follow a life of virtue and Christian piety, she informed them by way of identity that the author was an Ethiop. On recollection begins with Mem, begin, inspire ye sacred nine, your adventurous Afric in her great design. And in another poem, A Hymn to Humanity, written in honor of SPG Esquire, the African identity is underlined by rhetoric by rhetorical questions that mark the climax of our tribute in the lines, can Africa's muse forgetful prove, or can such friendship fail to move a, ten a tender human heart? While in the poem to his honor, the lieutenant governor of the de uh, on the death of his lady, the be bereaved husband is offered numerous consol consoling thoughts and reminded of the identity of the author of the consolation in the lines, nor canst thou, Oliver, assent refuse to heavenly tidings from the Afric muse. So she is African, and she makes no bones of the fact. Now, Arthur P. Davis, a literary critic, is probably right that, and I quote, Phyllis Whitley realized full well the propaganda value of our race and condition and used both to advantage. But it is also significant that her insistence on and reiteration of our African background are of a piece with her conception of her vocation as a poet. The linking of her destiny as poet to her origin as an African directs attention to the implication that the light that came from her as a talented artist in some mysterious way arose because 
she was of her race and from the continent of Africa. The evocations began to transcend a simple expedient and to look like a family-based commitment. The expression Afric Muse began to flesh out when taken together as a consistent self-identity into an assumption that the African could become a favored mouthpiece of the goddess of poetry and that creativity or genius as the Augustans chose to call it, was a universal gift of the spirit not res uh, restricted to any one charmed race or people. Such a position was revolutionary and challenge challenging to the racist prejudices of the time. Reprisals followed with vengeance and the redoubtable Virginian Thomas Jefferson lashed out that and I quote, the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in endowments both of body and mind. End of quote. And then referring pointedly to Phyllis Whitley, Jefferson wrote that her poems were, and I quote, below the dignity of criticism. And that, I quote again, the heroes of the Donciad are divinities when compared with the African muse. One has to see Phyllis Whitley's use of the expression African muse as going beyond the scope of neoclassical bland phraseology to understand the heavy-handed criticism of her by Jefferson. If it is remembered that she was not only one of the earliest Africans to express themselves in written literature, but that she was also the second earliest poetess of America, it would be seen why her identifying herself with Africa was so relevant and asset, an asset to the anti-slavery and anti-racist lobby of the 18th and 19th centuries and a source of intolerable annoyance to racists and supporters of slavery. Identification with Africa takes other forms in Phyllis Whitley's poetry than a mere outright statement of being an African. She uses her poems to spotlight deserving Africans. In the poem To My Kenas, which deals with the theme of inspirational creativity, Terence, an African slave and successful dramatist, is celebrated alongside Homer and Virgil as the, favored, uh, as the favorites of the muses. His being African is very heavily underlined in the following lines. The happier Terence, all the choir inspired, his soul replenished and his bosom tired. But say, ye muses, why this partial grace to one alone of Africa's sable race, from age to age transmitting thus his name with the first glory in the rolls of fame? He is highly praised, but there is also a note of regret that he was a lone star one alone of Africa's sable race, favored by the muses. She would wish that there were many more successful African artists and writers. When she noticed a black artist in the making around her, she devoted a long and warm exuding poem to encouraging and inspiring him. The poem was titled To SM, a young African, on seeing his works. Painted in a splendid vision that spreads from earth to sky and from time to eternity, her sentiments flowed from contem contemplating him and his works subjectively to broader perspectives in which both of them and probably the rest of her race were to be transported on seraphic pinions 
to that splendid city crowned with endless day. Phyllis Whitley's identification with her race and place of origin was, of course, always subject to her religious scruples. Reservations arising from her adherence to a puritanical strain of Christianity. New England, where she had her American upbringing, was a particularly strong religious environment, and this in turn left a clear imprint on her poetry. In fact, her poetry collection was, for that very reason, named Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. The Puritan fervor in her attitudes is shown by her unequivocal rejection of the paganism of her African homeland. Even though she identifies herself as an African, she was at pains also to repudiate non-Christian Africa and to count herself lucky as one of those who had gained their election, election in quotes, and calling, calling in quotes, into salvation. Her rejection of what she regarded as the unredeemed darkness of her African homeland is thus not altogether unexpected. Her reaction was just like that of Crowder, Wright, and Groniosa, among others. Two references to Africa in which this rejection is voiced have generally roused the severest uh, condemnation and anger from African and uh, African American critics of uh, Phyllis Whitley. The first example taken from the Harvard poem and reads as follows. Twas not long since I left my native shore, the land of errors and Egyptian gloom. Father of mercy, twas thy gracious hand brought me in safety from those dark abodes. The second example is a poem titled On Being Brought from Africa to America and reads as follows. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there is a God, that there is a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew, some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and joined and join the angelic train. The ingredients that cause annoyance are there, land of errors, Egyptian gloom, those dark abodes, my pagan land. But it is also true that Phyllis Whitley is not gleefully doing down her continent, but voicing a deeply held conviction that a land that neither sought nor knew the Savior was for that reason a seat of doom. That is Christian logic, which is understandable. Beyond that stereotype, however, is her genuine concern for the continent and its well-being. The continent can be saved. Its people are redeemable. They are perfectible. They may be refined. And not only that, but may even be saved and joined the angelic train. There is a subtle dig at the racists among the Christians who rejected the redeemability and perfectibility of the blacks and who made their devil in the image of Africans. The fact that Africa can and should be saved is an important theme in Phyllis Whitley's poetry. The appeal to Christians is firmly based it is that of one staunch believer to other staunch believers. In the poem on the death of the Reverend Mr. George Whitfield, the following lines occur. Take him, my dear Americans, be your complaints on his kind bosom laid. Take him, ye Africans, he longs for you. 
impartial Savior is his title due. Washed in the fountain of redeeming blood, you shall be sons and kings and priests to God. In the kingdom of the Christ, Africans would cease to be slaves and outcasts and the wretched of the earth. They would attain positions of privilege. They would become sons of God and therefore heirs to the kingdom. They would become kings and therefore leaders in their own right. They would become princes and therefore celebrities. All these are promised because the Savior is impartial. Those who accuse Phyllis Whitley of not caring enough about her people and continent have done her less than justice. On the question of slavery, she had not stood aside. She not only translated the, the French anti-slavery novel by Lavaille called Negro Equaled by Few Europeans, but she took her position unequivocally like the other African narrators and writers against that cancerous evil. She expresses most um, eloquently in a letter she wrote to Reverend Samson Okom in 1774. This letter was um, uh, highly serialized in newspapers in Connecticut and other um, major newspapers in New England. Her testimony is contained in the appeal to the Right Honorable William L. of the, uh, Dartmouth, His Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for North America. In the midst of all the conventional, conventionalities of the praise poem and official pleading, the following noteworthy lines occur. Should you, my Lord, while you peruse my song, Wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood. I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy, happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Stilled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. From her own severe suffering, her pangs excruciating for being torn away from her loving parents, she had developed a conscience partial to those who suffer deprivations of all sorts, but most particularly those of freedom. Her prayer was that others would never suffer the misfortune of slavery as she herself had. That was the impact of her appeal, an appeal which she shared with Coguano, Equano, and Ignacio Sancho, another feeling heart with whom she had much in common. I go on now to uh, uh, Sancho. The letters of the late Ignacio Sancho, an African, appeared in two volumes in 1782 and 1783, edited by Miss F. Crew. From the biographical fragment enclosed by the editor, and an account of his life in a letter to his longtime friend, the novelist Lawrence Stern, Sancho was born in a slave ship on its way from the coast of Ghana, of Guinea, to the Spanish Caribbean. He was baptized and given the name Ignatius by the Bishop of Cartagena. His mother died from a disease of the new climate soon after his birth, and his father, quote, defeated the misery of slavery by an act of suicide. At the age of two, he was brought to England and given by his master 
to three maiden sisters resident at Greenwich. We learn that he was self-educated, that he ultimately entered the services of the Duke and Duchess of Montague. These were liberal humanitarians who made him a butler and helped him to become a significant personality. They actually helped with his education. He was a friend of prominent men of letters and culture, such as the novelist Lawrence Stern, David Garrick, the Shakespearean actor, and Joseph uh, Nolikins, the artist. He himself became a man of cult cultural and critical accomplishments, and in addition to his correspondences, he wrote a, tra a treatise on music. Like Phyllis Whitley, Sancho openly and publicly identified with the black race and Africa. Not having lived in Africa, he could not depict those details of environment and culture which we find in the works and narratives of those born on the continent. But his identity is stated vigorously in his letters and his concern for Africans in Britain and elsewhere is very deep. In letter after letter, Sancho refers to his African origin and the fact of his being a black man. Scattered over the volumes of his letters are these references which are sometimes made in a facetious and self-mocking tone, sometimes seriously and at other times in an ironic or even sarcastic manner. In the letter to Stern, in which he reveals some of the autobiographical information, he writes, and I quote, I am one of those people whom the vulgar and illiberal call Negroes. In other contexts, he defines himself as, quote, not a raving mad wig, nor fawning deceitful Tory, but a cold, black, jolly African who wishes health and peace to every religion and country throughout the ample range of God's creation. He claims for himself a special African sensibility, much in a way that African negritude writers were to do nearly 200 years later. Reproaching the bringer of unappreciated gift, he said, and I quote, you must forgive me and call it the error of African false principles, call it anything but coldness and unfeeling pride, which is, in fact, ingratitude in a birthday suit. And in another letter, which is even more negritudinous, he wrote, I meant this not as an epistle of cold thanks, but the warm ebullition of African sensibility. The phrase warm ebullition of African sensibility is neat. It is not the kind of expression a writer uses absent-mindedly. The implication is that Sancho knew what he felt of his Africanness and was not only reflecting it in his life and actions, but made an effort when impelled by special circumstances to do so to put the feeling into elegant and memorable turn of language. His doing so is as deliberate as Phyllis Wheatley's insistence that she was not just an ordinary poet, but an African poet. Whether such a claim could be scientifically sustained is totally irrelevant at the point in which the concern was with self-image and self-identity with what the individual perceived to be his or her proper personality rather than what other people thought he or she should become. Sancho enlisted every opportunity to forward the interests of his poor black brethren from finding help for the black poor, even though he himself and his large family were almost always at the brink of destitution. He was also always defending Africans from calumny and racial stereotyping and attacking the institution of slavery 
and the African slave trade particularly. His commitment to black people as individuals and groups is concretely illustrated by his defense of Phyllis Wheatley from the more tendentious sorts of criticism which followed the publication of her poems in London in 1773. The poems roused opinions, some of which were favorable and, uh, and a few others critical. But it was clear that the more objectionable of our critics were racially biased. Sancho was outraged by, the kind of, by that kind of criticism that denied originality and creative talent to a writer simply because she was an African. His letter to Mr. F, many of these letters, he doesn't use their full names, in which he expressed his views is full of smoldering fire and undisguised contempt and is understandably linked to the question of Phyllis Wheatley's legal freedom. For it was not usually appreciated that she remained by status a slave until both his master and mistress had died and several years after the appearance of her poetry collection that made her famous. Sancho de deplored the shabbiness of treatment given to her to a, con a contributor to literary culture in a so-called age of enlightenment that made a fetish of culture and civilization. And here I quote um, Sancho's exact words. Phyllis' poems do credit to nature and put art, merely as art, to the blush. It reflects nothing either to the glory or generosity of her master if she is still his slave, except he glories in the low vanity of having in his wanton power a mind animated by heaven, a genius superior to himself. The list of splendid titled learned names in confirmation of her being the real authoress, alas, shows how very poor the acquisition of wealth and knowledge are without generosity, feeling, and humanity. These good, great folks all knew and perhaps admired, nay, praised genius in bondage. And then, like the priests and Levites in sacred writ, the Bible, passed by not one good Samaritan among them. The injustices and sufferings of the blacks in Britain, where he had lived in the Americas, the West Indies, or on the continent of Africa, never went unnoticed by Sancho. He had good <coughs> British friends and benefactors with whom he was in affectionate and warm relationship. His letters bear testimony to this fact that he was really a very warm sort of person. Nevertheless, the reality of racism and racial oppression was always there in the larger society and occasionally obtruded into private personal relationships. At such times, Sancho never failed to face the issue, to call racism and oppression by their proper names, and if necessary, to castigate them. In a letter to Mr. S. E., a fellow African, Sancho described the situation of the blacks in 18th century Britain with disapproval. Quote, look round upon the miserable fate of almost all of our unfortunate color. Superadded to ignorance, see slavery and the contempt of those very wretches who rule in affluence from our labors. Superadded to this woeful catalog, hear the ill-bred and heart-wracking uh, abuse of the foolish vulgar. You, A.C., tread as cautiously as the strictest rectitude can guide you, yet must you suffer from this. In other words, every African is open to being reviled and, uh, and, and, uh, and trampled. Sancho 
constantly sought to defend the good name of Africa and the integrity of the black race against the calumny of the Europeans. When a young British friend of his wrote to him complaining against, quote, the natives, whom he characterized as, quote, a set of deceitful people who have not such a word as gratitude in their language and who, quote, are like unto Jews in their dealings in trade, Sancho was outraged. He responded vigorously with a counterattack which seems to have successfully anticipated the anti-racist, anti-imperialist rhetoric of the 19th and 20th century Africans. His, his answer was systematically to dismantle the kind of hypocrisy and complacency that sheltered behind such accusations. My good friend, he wrote, you should remember from whom the black natives learned those vices. The first Christian visitors found them, the Africans, a simple, harmless people. But the cursed avidity for wealth urged these first visitors and all the succeeding ones to such acts of deception and even wanton cruelty that the poor ignorant natives soon learned to turn the knavish and diabolical act, acts which they soon imbibed upon their teachers. In other words, they'd learned villainy and villainous acts from the Europeans, and now they're using it against the Europeans. Uh, the myths are reversed here. The moral villains became the heroes, and the former heroes are rolled in dawn. If the natural goodness of the native of the African as a representative figure is overplayed, it is because that was the only way in the Manichaean world of colonial slavery of ensuring some fairness for him, for the African. The view was widely canvassed in anti-slavery circles and African abolitionists like Coguano and Equano strongly held it. If the native was to become a noble savage as a means of shedding the ignoble image fashioned for him by racists and slave traders, then African writers of the day were ready to go along with the strategy for the ultimate purpose of bringing freedom. Sancho's rhetoric, rhetorical approach in this letter was to organize his response in an ever-ascending column of outrage. The next level concretizes the crimes of the English against the natives. Quote, I am sorry to observe that the practice of your country, which as a resident I love, and for its freedom, and for the many blessings I enjoy in it, shall ever have my warmest wishes, prayers, and blessings. I say it is with reluctance that I must observe your country's conduct has been uniformly wicked in the East West Indies and even on the coast of Guinea. The grand object of English navigators is money, money, money. The peak of rhetorical indignation is reached when Sancho talks about the slave trade he shared with the other African writers of this period an abhorrence of slavery and deprecated the brutalities which the system imposed on the African people. Whenever he wrote about it in his letters, anger was never far from the surface. His sarcasm became barbed. Augustan propriety in style and language, which he subscribed to in other contexts, broke down altogether on the theme of slavery. The voice became shrill, the tongue sharp and full of acerbity, and the, the tone became impassioned. The following passage, taken from the letter quoted above, illustrates the highest point of what one may call Sancho's rhetoric of indignation. Quote, In Africa, the poor wretched natives 
blessed with the most fertile land and luxuriant soil, are rendered so much the more miserable for whom, uh, for what providence meant as a blessing. The Christians' abominable traffic for slaves and the horrid cruelties and treachery of petty kings encouraged by their Christian customers who carry them strong liquors to inflame their national madness and powder and powder, that's gunpowder, and bad firearms to furnish them with the means of killing and kidnapping. Sancho recognized the slave trade as a moral issue with its roots in economics, as both Coguano and the Kwano had done, and could probably have advanced religious, economic, and humanitarian arguments for its abolition. But he concentrated his effort on an aspect, on an appeal to the affective and humane faculties such as literature and the arts could achieve. Thus, he enlisted the support of the novelist Stern, who was a personal friend of his, to give one half, and I'm quoting uh, Sancho here, to give one half hour's attention to slavery, as it is at this day practiced in our West Indies. His reason being that, quote, that subject handled in your striking manner would ease the yoke of many, end of quote. Through his concern for the Africans and their predicament, Sancho attained a certain clarification of his own personal attitudes. He appreciated tolerance as a view of life and the values of humanity and compassion. In many of his letters, he emphasized his strong attachment to the principles of tolerance in religious and secular affairs, and sympathy and compassion for all who were persecuted, victimized, or oppressed. He saw the link between inhumanity and intolerance and the repudiation of the values which he had been taught to expect as the heritage of Christianity. In his view, and I quote, the general inhumanity of mankind proceeds first from the uh, cursed false principle of common education, and secondly from a total difference, indifference, if not disbelief, of the Christian faith, end of quote. The education referred to was the hard, harsh, utilitarian education that did nothing to temper the fierceness of the human heart, to curb the passions, and to infuse the soul with the shared concern for well-being, fellow feeling, and brotherhood. In Sancho's view, the Western obsession with material success, reinforced with contempt for other people, whether because they were of different religion or race, created a certain moral amnesia and an atmosphere within which collective crimes and massive atrocities were possible. After watching from the grocery, his grocery store, he was a keeper of a grocery store, the outburst of fanaticism by London mobs against the Irish, liberals, and Roman Catholics, Sancho exclaimed, I am not sorry I was born an Afrique. He was, of course, not born in, on the African soil, but at sea. But Africa remained his spiritual homeland. For Sancho, as well as for the other dispersed Africans, Africa remained enshrined in the soul. Each of them lived a double life, one life which was shared with the inhabitants of the new environment, and the other life which was an internal life locked in the memory full of realities and dreams and visions, which remained the essential life of the spirit. In spite of the vicissitudes and difficulties of the new environment, the African survived by drawing emotional, psychological, and moral energy from that Africa within. The narratives and jottings of Africans in the 18th and early 19th centuries give testimony to that fact. Thank you.
seem to have a, a larger mission and I'm, I guess, dismissing it in the fashion that he did. Yeah, it, it, it was more of an isolated um, comment. He, this is in the notes um, on the state of, uh, Virginia. of Virginia. It's it's a place where he actually defined his general view of things. And um, slavery was an aspect. The Africans were there. They lived with him. He knew them and saw them and interacted with them more intimately than most people. But, and, uh, and, yeah. but as a matter of fact, he, um, so when he took, took on uh, Phyllis Whitley, he was really developing a thesis. And he had always been interested in the state of civilization. Um, Europe was the ideal, of course. Um, but in, um, within America itself, he was um, interested in seeing probably the U European uh, civilization realities replicated here. Um, but then he saw the blacks as a sort of, now uh, here the, are these people almost uh, destroyers as negative force in this, in the refinement of American life. These people are not bringing positive contribution to it. Because Phyllis Whitley stands out. She'd written a, book, uh, a, a, a collection of poems and people were celebrating her and um, using her as uh, uh, an example of, um, well, the fact that the blacks are also capable of creativity. Um, and this was, um, went counter to the racist views. And all, all the people who were interested in the emancipation of the slaves, uh, we are actually tackling this thing that the Africans were a subspecies of humanity. Somehow, the, bringing them as slaves was a, the doing a favor to them. We are probably bringing them into the mainstream of civilization. They don't have all the attributes of civilization. They, have, they cannot create literature. They have, of course, well, most of these things were actually held in, in error. Um, but he was reacting to this thing, people saying, now, here you are, here is an African who is creative, who is written poems, and these poems are just as good as those of the uh, Augustans. And he was um, outraged, how could you? These are not um, the equivalent of white people. And actually, referring to the Donciad, um, because to understand uh, Phyllis Whitley's poetry, you really have to um, go to the poetry of Alexander Pope and people of that time. The, her poetry, if you scanned it, would fit into the Augustan um, uh, pattern of, of poetry. And so by dismissing it, he went to the Donciad, which was uh, Pope's way of tackling the bad poets of his time. He says the poets those who were damaged by Alexander Pope uh, in the poem he called the Donciad. He said the, the poets of the Donciad are like divinities. <laughs> they are gods when you compare them to the African muse. In other words, that's you. there's no other, way, no other way you can treat this. The, the thing is below the dignity of criticism. Don't even try. Don't even bother about this. It's no poetry. And... Um, I don't think that he sat down and, and did uh, literary critical analysis of uh, Phyllis Whitley's poetry. He did not do that. If he did, he would have seen that there was a lot. Um, she had a lot in common with the, um, her contemporaries. Uh, but it was just a kind of, um, uh, I, I hate to say it before Americans, but because um, this man was, is an iconic figure in American history. But um, reading that kind of thing, it's a very underhand kind of um, position to take. Well, another word for it. Sorry? <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs>
Jefferson was a deist. He was a deist. He was not a very orthodox Christian. So if, um, Whitley's um, orthodoxy didn't uh, mount much further with uh, Jefferson. Jefferson was not... Uh, this girl was brought up in the tradition of the Puritans. And, um, but, but Jefferson was the very opposite of that kind of Christianity. She... He was hardly a Christian at all, you know. He, he, in fact, separation of church and state was essentially his own contribution to the whole thing. <laughs> you know, he says, "Keep them apart." You know, keep the virus away from, from, uh, from the body. You know, the the the, the, the body um, politic. Don't mix them. For, to him, religion is something contagious and uh, dangerous. Um, he wasn't a, well he was exceptional in, in, in the sense that he didn't really advance any um, what you might call uh, aesthetic reasons for rejecting there were some who would make some aesthetic comments which is understandable in literary criticism you can approve a work or you can disapprove of it on the basis of its technical strength or weakness but this one was, had nothing to do with whether the, um, the mechanics of the organization of the poetry were right and so on. Nothing to do with it. It just says, the blacks are inferior. Full stop. This thing is not poetry because it's written by a black. Full stop. This thing, you know, there's no aesthetic basis to that judgment. You see the point? So um, the people who idealize and lionize uh, Jefferson as a founding father, that's fine. I mean, this is, he's become, a, he is in fact an iconic figure, um, a figure of history and uh, very important in this making of this country. And I, um, I think people are quite um, welcome to uh, idolize him. But I know what I know. I know that he could not have been my friend, if I were. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? I just have a question about Hillary Lee and her status as a woman. Because I know that I read a lot about um, people who wrote about the first, like the contemporary. They really don't comment on her being a woman, right? They said a lot about her being African. Really um, proud of her, I, I suspect. The black women, particularly, she, the, uh, the Obotana, who was another African girl living uh, in one of the New England states, they exchanged very lively letters. It's, they were kindred spirits, and so on. And she wrote to religious people like Reverend Ockham, and and she she had strength real strength, even when she wrote in prose, 
as opposed to her poetry. Um, and she, she had strong feelings too. Um, don't forget that at that time the women really hadn't come into their own. They, they were still trying to find the, their fo foothold in a very masculine uh, traditionalist society. And isn't she the first woman to venture into the field of poetry? If she's not the first, she might be the second. But I suspect she is the first. That makes her special. Um, but at the time, the women hadn't come into their own. They were not really, they were to be seen but not heard at the time. You know. If you, you know American social history a lot better than I do. Yes? Yes. And and that always uh, but but and that was generally what was written by white authors. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot more about these things than I do. Um the this um the new criticism was an attempt by critics to become scientists, to use the tools of science um to analyze essentially um, experiential works. Um, it, it had a short period, you know, when you, you had to devote all the attention to the, wor the, 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 the word on the page kind of thing, and not to go beyond that. What I, I'm doing here would, would be anathema to those, um, the, the new critics. They say, oh, wh why are you talking about um, all these things, go to the, uh, well, I, I have a bit of the new critic myself I, because I look at the text as the mainstay of the interest, but I can then go beyond the text to see because it, a, text, a text is not really a uh, self-contained and self-sufficient thing. A text is something that expresses something larger than itself. It's taken from life and just encapsulated on the on a, a flimsy piece of paper. But the substance of, is the experience, which is a lot larger. And the advantage of going beyond the um, new critics and this, um, the printed word on the printed page, uh, the advantage is that you do have room to range in, to draw in and make comparisons and, you know, just move anywhere you can, as long as you have points of, um, of contact and significance, you can do a lot of ranging around and so on. Um, but the, I don't even know that new critics will find this wonderful, um, because the writers are drawing largely on their own personal experiences. And... Uh, because the new critics will find uh, uh, Phyllis Wheatley quite uh, tailored for them. She's a very competent poet, and she, you can actually um, analyze her work entirely on the basis of its, its uh, position on the page. You can scan the lines. You can um, make deductions. The, rhymes, the rhyme scheme is very regular and all those things. You can get all of that. Um, 
But what I've tried to do is to relate our work to contemporary ideas. How, how would you, looking at this poem, how does it um, relate to the general um, experience of black people at the time? And I think Phyllis Whitley herself would actually endorse what I'm doing, which is to relate her poetry to her feelings about lots of things, about people, about the status of black people, and so on. There's a lot more um, to her writing than just <coughs> the words on the page. She brings into, into it a large array of personal feelings and uh, uh, ramifications in the larger society. I, I don't know that I have answered your question, but yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some, some, some of our critics try to be f formalists, but there are very few, and they are not very popular. Everybody thinks they, they are wacky, you know, how, look at them, they are just uh, fiddling with words. And um, African literature is literature of, of ideas, and, and, and it, 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 it falls into its existence lots and lots of um, ramifications about society and ideas beyond the text itself. The text is a mere encapsulation, but the, the range of interests is a lot bigger and wider than the text. Yeah. We don't have many. see that in a way, and, and do any of them explicitly reflect on kind of the question of what's the best way, in effect, to attack racism, right? To break down the ideas or to, in effect, reach some more affective, emotional, or kind of heart-based understanding? Mm. Well, yeah, the, where the, the form itself controls the, um, the message, I, I think, yeah, because she's, she's using poetry. Right. And poetry uh, has, um, makes a direct impact on the, on the feelings and so on. So she's, uh, she has a direct line. Well, these others are using prose, and prose is, has indirection. Um, of course, a letter is even narrower because a letter is addressed to one person. But within that letter, you are dealing with public issues and generalized um, attitudes. Um, it's a good thing that letters have been published. But suppose they were not. One person would have just gritted his teeth. He would be grinding his teeth at this man who is attacking his people and uh, this and that. But here now the thing is public property. Um, but prose has its own appeal. Its appeal is more diffused, whereas poetry is a lot more um, direct and so on. But you are right. I think you're, you're right in the approaches are determined, um, the impact of the approaches are determined by the form that's, um, that's used. Yeah. But Equano, well, what he does is to use indirection. You know, he says, you, the white people, think this and about the black people. I think they are wrong. They are wrong for these reasons. The, the, the white people, they build monuments tall buildings, but there are many people sleeping under bridges. 
nobody, it's not everybody who can build a, a monument or live in a tall house. But certainly in this society, everybody can, everybody is an architect. By the fact, I mean, you can, all you need is the support of the community. They would, um, and all you need is to prepare meals at the end of it and some palm wine to wash down the meals. And that's it. And you have a house, you know, over your, yourself. So everybody, there are no homeless in this society. And he says, well, you're talking about civilization. How civilized is a society in which some people don't have even basic things like shelter and so on? It, that's where you reduce the thing to a certain practical level. Um, in that kind of argument and debate, um, these people are holding their own. And I think people who um, read Equano were fairly convinced that the way of life he projected was adequate for the people at that particular time. It had its own virtues. Um, it's not something you could then wave away uh, with co contempt. Because the pri principle is a valid one, that people need shelter, they need food. When you say, oh, these are foul eaters, there's, uh, it, it, there's some literature to that effect. The pro-slavery ideologues were saying, oh, these Africans, they eat uh, entails. Is it entails? They call them chitlins. Chitlins or something. These are foul eaters. They, they'll kill animals and they use the, the, eat the internal organs and things like that. Well, Equano is saying they're not, they're not foul eaters. They eat normal. They eat bullock, cattle, goats, chicken, like everybody else. But they don't even over, overdo them. You know, they, they are fresh. They are well cooked. They don't debauch. The word debauch is very good here. The kind of European cooking that debauches the taste, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, the defense is vigorous. These, these people knew what they were doing. Um, I have a lot of respect for them uh, because they had a lot to um, fight for and against. And the forces they were fighting against were entrenched forces of self-interest. These slave traders did not... They were not unaware of the moral ambiguity of their situation. I, I have worked on the letters of Philip Kwakwe from Cape Coast, Ghana. And uh, here was an African who was a missionary among um, slave traders. He, he had joined appointment to Cape Coast Castle. The church missionary society uh, was the main uh, uh, employer. But the African committee, as a committee of slave traders, was also part of the employer. The, so his salary was paid by both bodies, the church and the, the slave traders. The, the church with its own humane and uh, you know, moral concerns, and the slave traders in this dubious kind of uh, situation. And Philip Kwakwe was a chaplain in the Cape Coast Castle. His job was to convert the, the Akans, who are easily the most traditionalist Africans. He said, go and convert those natives. But while doing that, minister to the Europeans who are carrying on slave trade along the coast. His mission failed. The Europeans would not go to communion. They would not baptize their children. In fact, the governor of the, of, of the castle on one occasion, uh, Philip Kwakwe said, now you have three children, mainly by African women, uh, you know, they call them wenches. <laughs> so you, you have three children. I, I'd like to baptize them. And the man started fobbing him off. These people, so after a while he said, but you haven't been coming to communion. And the man said, how can I come to communion when I am in this terrible state? State of sin. They knew slavery as a state of sin. I cannot approach the holy altar to come and receive communion when I am in 
doing something palpably wrong. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. But that was that moral ambiguity. Philip Kwakwe's mission failed. He, was, he had the gift of long life, which was rather unfortunate because to live for so long and in the end to have to say, I have failed, it's not very easy to, to take. It's probably if you had a short life and you tried and you failed and you, it's bad readers, you know, and so you, you went away. But this man was there for 50 years. He was proselytizing. The Fanti, we are not converted. The Fanti were very traditionalist people. The, these um, Cape Coast um, Panims, the elders, kept fobbing him off. And they, they would go to church, all right, and he would, they would sit down and listen to him preach. But they would not convert. They would not chase away their many wives just so as to become good Christians or anything. So in the end, he failed because the moral environment was inimical to the entrenchment of certain of those human values. Um, he just declared, I have failed. And worse than that, he wrote, he wrote letters every month to his employers, the Church of England. In 50 years, he got two replies. I came to the conclusion after reading Philip Kwakwe's letters that silence is the weapon of the powerful. That loquacity, talk, 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 is in fact the matter of the powerless. If you are without power, you, you tend to be loquacious. You talk and talk and complain and complain. <laughs> the powerful can afford not to say anything. Just sit down and look at you. <laughs> <laughs>